Hello, and welcome to A Deadly Silence. I'm your host, Larry Curtis, and it is the goal of all of us associated with our program to bring you current and educational information concerning the alcohol and drug addiction issues not only here in the city of Brockton, but throughout our South Shore community. Today, our guest is Tom Audette. Tom, welcome to our show. Thank you, Larry. Tom is a parent of a loved one who passed from a drug overdose back in 2008. Uh, Tom is a resident of Plymouth, Massachusetts, and uh, he is here to share with us his story as to the uh, addiction issue associated with his daughter, Jillian. And I believe she was 22. 23. 23 yeah. at the time that she passed. And uh, to share kind of with our audience what, as a family, happened and how did this tragedy ultimately take place? Yeah. Well, Jillian, when we, first I want to describe Jillian um, in general. Um, Jillian was a very happy kid. Uh, you could even call her silly. Um, laughed at everything. She would enjoy doing homework, would actually laugh going to the dentist, those kinds of events. She was a type of kid that was bright-eyed, always laughing, always having fun um, with her friends and uh, even around the house. Loved to laugh. She had the kind of infectious laugh that you could not help but bring the whole room down laughing with her when she was in one of those um, kinds of moods. Um, as a young girl, again, playful, normal stuff. She played softball, into arts and crafts, fun things that little girls do. Uh, as she got older, she started to like the whole uh, makeup scene, hair cutting. Um, so she decided that when she went to high school that this was a trade that she wanted to do, possibly run her own business one day. And my wife and I used to see her as somebody that would own a business someday, uh, a real go-getter, on the ball. She was going to make it somewhere and do something with her life that, that was uh, productive. So, um, at, so during her high school years, basically, she was uh, an average student, uh, you know, friends in the neighborhood, involved in different activities within the school and the, and the community, and uh, she graduated high school, obviously. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. She average kid in yeah. high school. Mm -hmm. She, you know, she wanted to do things we said no to. You know, she went to her dances and got her limo to go to proms, those kinds of oh, things, yeah. like, mm -hmm. any, like any other girl does. Um, literally, I could count on one hand the, the times that we had any issues with her as a teenager. She was a good kid. Some nights where the weather was bad, we didn't want her driving kind of thing, you know, uh, we, we dealt with that kind of stuff, but she was a good kid, responsible kid. Um, if we needed her to be home at a certain time, she would be. Okay, so during that whole high school era, there was nothing that was flagged or anything going on that you could see, and nothing. she graduated high school, you felt proud as, as a father yep. and as a family. Yeah, no, no red flags whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as she got a little bit older and she turned 21, uh, she enjoyed the nightlife scene, getting out with friends. Um, you know, that she liked. She definitely liked going out dancing, out to the nightclub. And in Plymouth, of course, there's a, a million choices where people can go um, in downtown. Down the waterfront. Correct. Yeah. So mm -hmm. she enjoyed that. We reminded her about uh, making that phone call, not drinking and driving. And she actually would. She would call and make that call. Listen, I'm not going to come home. I'm staying over, you know, Julie's house, Sally's house, you know, Christine's house, whatever friend she might mention. Mm -hmm. um, and she wasn't going to be coming home. And that was a, a preference that we had that she always checked yeah. in. And, and she would. And these so, friends that she had, you were familiar as a parent with their parents, those type of things. So yes. there wasn't any need to feel that on something behind was happening. Correct. Okay. Correct. Good. Good. Uh, when yeah. she had, you know, when she dated, um, you know, we she would bring the boyfriends home. Of course, I would make them come in, <laughs> give that bone crushing handshake, you know, <laughs> send that fatherly message all the time. But, uh, but and, uh, no. And again, we we. We knew who she was hanging around with when she was younger. As she got a little bit older and started a little bit more of an independent lifestyle, mm -hmm. more time away from home, that's when that disconnection happens a little bit. But mm -hmm. again, still no real red flags. She even moved into an apartment at one time with some friends and recognized the problem there, told my wife about it. Okay, no problem, we'll come get you. We packed her up, brought her back home. Mm -hmm. So, And again, reinforcement that the foundation we built was strong and she was doing the right thing. And making so the no, right calls. No yeah. concerns that she was going to make any poor decisions about something like this. So what happened then? I mean, you know, you're basically she's 21 now, doing the club scene with the friend, still following all of the values that as a parent you instill in her and doing the right thing. So what happened? I don't know when... It started or any kind of drug use had started and if it was while she was still living at home it was certainly hidden very well from us where we were not again not and, seeing and any they red say plans. in the addiction world that an addict can potentially high 
an addiction issue for up to two years yeah. without you realizing it. Yeah, and, yeah. and that, yeah. that could have been, could have been. I, I don't know. I don't think yeah. it was that long. Uh, but she, she had met a boyfriend, uh, nice enough guy. I, I feel I was always a good judge of character. In mm -hmm. this case, I ended up being wrong. Um, nice guy, good-looking guy, in shape. Uh, that whole stereotype about what a drug user looks like, not at all. Uh, we, we, are, we have that impression from television and movies of that drug addict is this strung out kind of unhealthy looking individual. This guy looked like he could have been playing professional soccer. You know, he was fit, mm -hmm. um, no red flags there uh, at all when, as, as far as anything physical, and he happened to be a, a career heroin addict. Um, and again, no signs. Mm -hmm. He'd be over the house out by the pool with his shirt off kind of thing. Just yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely nothing that would make me concerned at all. Mm -hmm. uh, at, at some point, they were dating for a while, and Jillian decided she was going to move in with him. Uh, I sat with her boyfriend and talked to him. You know, he was about uh, eight, eight or nine years older than she was. Okay. So a little bit of concern with, you know, Jillian was kind of naive, yep. you know, for mm -hmm. her age. I uh, wanted to make sure she was going to be, you know, taken care sure. of and safe with him type thing. Uh, and again, no real red flags there. She had moved out. Um, they went into one apartment and then moved into another apartment that they liked better, was bigger, more room yep. and so mm -hmm. forth, helped them move both times. And uh, again, no, no flags, no, flags, no real like, issues. Mm -hmm. um, and it was probably a couple months after that uh, second move, I don't remember exactly the timeline, mm -hmm. that um, my wife and I uh, were going out one night on a charity event, uh, police and fire hockey game that they were doing over in Kingston. Uh, that, might, that night, my daughter had come by to do some laundry at the house and pick up some things. And, of course, there was always snacks to take back home with her. Oh, my yes. wife would bake some <laughs> cookies or brownies. I have three, sure. three adult sons who do so, the same thing. <laughs> so she was over the house, and, and she was a little different that night. She was talking about uh, her relationship, wasn't very happy with what was going on in her world. Very unlike Jillian. She, she was definitely mm. down, depressed, not, not the happy kid that I'm used to seeing. And... In, in hindsight, she, the, she was reaching out, but I wasn't looking at it that way. I thought this was the whole boyfriend-girlfriend thing. You know, why are, why are guys so, you know, this and right. that and mm -hmm. so forth. So, and I'm telling her, you know, at your age, it shouldn't be this hard. If, rela if your relationship is this hard, come on back home for a while, take a break. And she had talked about wanting to get back into uh, golfing. She had started taking okay. up golf and mm -hmm. wanted, wanted to, in a sense, get her friendship back. She felt she was kind of... Um, concealed with this relationship okay. where she wasn't exposed to her friends and family as much as she would like to be. So where she had such a vibrant, outgoing relationship with all of her friends in high school and growing up, you know, in the club scene and so forth, now she's kind of shut, shut it in by a boyfriend or overshadowing. And this gentleman was eight years old, yeah. as you were saying. Yeah. So it seemed to yeah. me that, that that night she was Smothering. just not herself. Yeah. So it was about 6 o'clock. I ended up dropping her back uh, at home at her apartment, and I met my wife over at the function that we had gone to. Um, so we had come home that night afterwards, and a little after 3 o'clock in the morning, we got a knock at the door. Uh, happened to be two police officers we know very well, uh, friends of ours that had come to the door, and just the look on the face is, is unmistakable. You know, two words, it, it's Jillian. That's all he said. And, we knew what that meant, and just it was it was very very hard. It was it was um, um, a tough thing to go through. Parents' worst nightmare. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Almost six years now, and it's it's still we still have our days where we we come apart. Um, sure. My mm -hmm. son, who was 13 at the time, was not home. He was staying over a friend's house because my wife and I were going to be out late. So mm -hmm. we had made arrangements for him to stay with a friend. Um, so the the morning was just filled with police officers coming by, friends of ours coming by the house, and forming family members, which we wish we could have just kept it all to ourselves and not burdened anyone else with, with it. Um, but we had to, and, you know, telling the family, telling my 13-year-old son I had to go get him and bring him home, um, and going through that whole um, process. And, and we, we struggled yeah. for a while, just how did that happen? Yeah. What happened? You know, where, where she knew better. We were angry. How could she do something mm -hmm. so stupid? You know, uh, and we just, we just never thought she would ever make decisions like that. This story, as heartbreaking as it is, is almost the reverse of what you hear more often than not with an addict that ultimately overdoses, is that usually there's a progression from, you know, some type of, you know, pills taken during the course of their addiction, you know, leading up to the heroin. This sounds almost as if 
you know, something happened? You can't, were you ever able to put your finger on it as to, you know? The, actually, no. I, I, we, we heard afterwards that it, it was not going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, it was relatively new. Uh, she had one um, incident um, probably two years earlier when she was up skiing with some friends and she had drank too much and okay. ended up having to go to the hospital. Um, um, I want to say Jack Daniels, but I don't Alcohol remember. Alcohol poisoning drinking. or something like but that. Yeah, yeah, she, right, they, yeah. The mm -hmm. kids were doing shots yeah. or whatever mm -hmm. it was, but she yeah. drank too much. I believe she was 21 at the time in that right. first mm -hmm. year. But that was the only uh, like incident, incident we had. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. that, um, and again, we're overnight, yeah. staying at the bed, that kind of thing yeah, and so right. forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as far as the um, the drug world uh, type thing, we didn't have those red flags and those struggles and those yeah. where is she? Mm -hmm. I can't mm -hmm. find. Yeah. You know, yeah. we didn't go yeah. through any of that. So we're six years later now. Um, your son, who was thirteen, is now nineteen. You know, your wife. Um, what's been happening since then? You know, I mean, what? I mean, obviously. You know, it, it, it's very, very emotional for any parent to lose a loved one like that, uh, uh, particularly in this, these type of circumstances, because it was unforeseen. It, you know, there was nothing to say that it was, you know, a, a, you know, a, a continuation of a drug habit or something of that nature. So um, what has happened in the last six years for your wife, yourself, and the, the, your son? You know? Well, the, the first, again, for a while we were in kind of a fog um, I think it takes a while for that shock to wear off and, and the, for it to, the heavy weight of it to really settle in. Um, we, we struggled with the, the voice that was stronger than our own as parents. You know, what, who could have convinced her? And again, she, mm -hmm. ultimately she's responsible. She made the decisions. However, there was a voice stronger than that of the parents that have always said right from wrong that had enough of an influence to make her change her mind. And we talked about the, it's, it's a friend, it's somebody they know, it's somebody close. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife and I joked about the Eddie Haskell in the world, you know, that, oh, right. that Eddie mm -hmm. Haskell friend, that it's somebody that you would welcome in your home. Uh, our kids never wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to decide today to go try some hard drugs right. and I'm mm -hmm. going to go look for that scary drug, uh, drug dealer right. mm -hmm. in the dark alley. They never meet that guy. The, key, the person they meet is somebody very close to them. It's usually a friend, you know, and, and that's, that's the tough part that, okay, and the kids aren't trying to hurt anybody. They're being kids. Uh, and how do, you, how do you educate a kid not to be a kid? How do we teach this generation not to be like our generation? And, you know, when we were kids, you know, kids, kids do things that are crazy. I myself, yeah. I never got into drugs uh, when I was younger, but... I got into alcohol and I was drinking when I wasn't supposed to when I was mm -hmm. a kid. And, and these, are, these are behaviors that none of us should be doing. But I was a kid and I was influenced and I did this kind of thing. The difference today is that influence is killing kids. The product the peer has, pressure. The, the yeah, peer the pressure is, has changed. Right. Oh, oh, well, the, the potency of any type of drug that's out there today is you know, certainly far far more potent than it was when we were kids, you yes. know, from, the, from that perspective. There, yeah. you know, and you didn't yeah. hear about, when we were kids, there were, you know, there was that percentage of kids that escalated on to a different drug, yeah. but they weren't dying from it. You know, you, mm -hmm. you, you didn't hear about that when we were kids. And if they were, much like today, it was kept very quiet and we just didn't know about it. Right. Uh, another very hard thing that hit home with my wife and I, I was out at, at this local restaurant where my daughter used to work, and there were a couple of girls that were there that knew who my daughter was. They didn't know me. And they were talking to one of the staff about Jillian. And one of the girls had mentioned she knew she had gotten into trouble and with drugs and into heroin, but she didn't want to get her in trouble and say anything. You know, hearing that was, was so wow. hard to hear that. And it, and it, it changed. It, it, it set a whole different light on another area that I wanted to focus on because I believe there are a lot of people out there that know that they have friends that are it's, in trouble and it's not yeah. getting them in, in It's in not trouble. snitching. It's saving. It, it, it's, it's not saving. snitching. It's saving. Yeah, <laughs> because right, once, you know. once they yeah. take that path and get involved with this addictive drug, they can't get out of it themselves. They need help. And if more people recognize that and would reach out on their behalf and don't tell their parents or the police, tell your own parents, tell somebody, uh, let somebody make the decision to help. Um, so, so from that to trying to bring awareness, you know, we struggled with what direction to go in. 
uh, we really didn't know what to do. We knew we wanted to do something. We had to help. Uh, we didn't want this um, to go with us just sitting by and not doing something to help another family. So we had talked about what we could do. I, I started to write a book. My, uh, we started to do research online. We started to do a website. All these things that we started and, and didn't follow through with because it still didn't feel right. Mm -hmm. So we were still trying to reach out. Um, I happened to be a few years ago at a, at a neighborhood uh, political event uh, where Tom Calter and his, and yep. his assistant Amy mm -hmm. uh, were there, and I had the chance to talk to them for a while. They didn't know the start of the conversation that I had lost a child, right. which I didn't say that on purpose because I wanted his attention when I was making my point. So we talked for a while, and I really made an impact with them when I finally shared that not only did I lose a child, but another family from the same nice cul-de-sac neighborhood also recently had lost a child to the same, to an addiction the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so they had reached out to me and invited me to join a panel, a drug awareness panel, and I, and I was so glad because this was finally heading in a direction I had been looking for to try and do something just like this where I could get the message out there, talk about the experience that my daughter went through and our family went through and what we can do to possibly educate kids, or, or educate may not even be the word, but just steer them in a different direction. Well, I mean, education is, is the key in the yeah. end, and I, I, and I want to kind of get into the uh, whole program that you participated in a little bit, because I think it is important that, you know, the, the loved ones of an addict, whether they're struggling with an addict now, or even if, you know, in your case, you've lost a loved one, you know, to the addiction issue, to understand that the, that the message is a powerful message of intervention and, and recovery that needs to get out there. And, you know, uh, Peggy and I here from A Deadly Silence, we have two sons that uh, have been in, in recovery today, uh, but were uh, uh, addicted to the heroin situation. And we felt that we needed to get word out there somehow because as parents, we didn't know where to turn to. So uh, give us a little bit about the... Um, the um, awareness program that you participated in now? So there was a, a panel um, at uh, Kingston Middle School, and um, District Attorney uh, Tim Cruz uh, was there as well, talking about some of the uh, current trends that were going on. Um, there was somebody from a medical board, I, I don't recall the names from everybody on the panel, uh, that was talking about some of the traits of addiction, some of the red flags of addiction, and just what the drugs actually do. Uh, there were some school resource officers and uh, uh, Tom's son, Ryan, uh, Kingston police officer, mm -hmm. who was talking about the, the fact that it does not discriminate. Uh, children from all families from everywhere are being affected by this drug. Uh, it didn't matter where you lived, what size income you had, mm -hmm. it was affecting all families. Um, there was a, a group with an academy. Um, Independence I, Academy. Independence Academy <laughs> yeah. that were also talking about... Um, their, their um, program where they're bringing these uh, yep. kids mm -hmm. in, getting them their uh, high school diplomas and, and, and taking them to and, a new and level. And that's, with that's a recent development here in the South Shore. Actually, Independence Academy is located here in the city of Brockton, and it is actually a, a recovery high school for students within the South Shore communities, not just here in the city of Brockton, but all of the communities comprising the South Shore of Massachusetts, to be able to come to an alternative high school and continue their education if they have an addiction issue and be in an environment that is supportive with the appropriate counseling and guidance, you know, to keep them, you know, on the right track to, in the recovery process. So uh, Richard Melillo, I think, is the executive director there. And I know that um, here in the city of Brockton, actually, uh, our current mayor, Bill Carpenter, uh, was very instrumental in in getting the Independence Academy School uh, through the legislature with the help of the state and uh, state senator Tom Kennedy, some of the local reps, Michael Brady, uh, Senator Keenan down in, in Quincy now. They were very, very helpful get, getting this program up and running here in the South Shore. And we're the only, it's, it, we only have four of those high schools here in the Commonwealth today. You know, but uh, it's an important program that parents should understand is out there for anybody who is dealing with an addiction issue in the high school throughout the South Shore community to be able to get their child enrolled and continue to get a high school diploma. You know. Yeah, and, and it sounds like a great program, and, and it sounds like we need more of those. Um, 
And in addition to that panel, I've been invited to speak at another one at Plymouth North April 1st. I've also been doing a lot of research online and finding out what programs some different towns are doing um, up in Quincy. Uh, Detective Patrick Glynn with the Narcan that he introduced yep. where all the police officers are carrying Narcan and they've had hundreds of reversals that may have been fatalities. Absolutely. Um, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And one of the most um, powerful things that he said to me is it took him a while, but he has the support of not only the entire police department, but the community. And, and that's a big part of it, too. When, when the police yeah. are spearheading it, it carries on a lot more weight. When they see that the police yeah. mm -hmm. are, are trying to help. So because of that, I started reaching out to some different police chiefs. I talked to the police chief here in Brockton, um, and he's the one who put me in touch with Nancy. Former, uh, former chief police, Manny Gomes. Uh, uh, and uh, we yep. just recently had a, an interim oh, I, police chief assigned last week. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. But he, he spent a lot of time with me on the phone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very informative. Actually taught me more about the drug than I had ever known. Mm -hmm. um, some different um, trends about the prices years ago to today. Yep. The, the potency, as you mentioned before, and the different forms that the kids are finding the drugs right. in today. Mm -hmm. Um, so I had called Nancy, and she was more than happy to give me additional information, and this is where I, I actually yep. uh, found out about and you. And that's Officer and Nancy program. Lieberg in the Brockton Police Department who runs the Not My Kid program, Correct. which is geared toward the middle school age kids, I believe, and the parents to come out and understand you know, what their loved ones are potentially being exposed to out there. You know, as, as Even though we're sending our our kids to school, we believe they're in a protective environment. It's, it's only protected to a certain extent, you know. Correct. Because <laughs> that peer pressure is there. Yeah, and I would have fallen into that not in my kid category uh, for sure years ago where no way, right. no way would my daughter my, do this. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I would have been very confident saying that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, it's, again, shocking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I understand the importance of that program that she's trying to uh, implement, um, and I hope it continues to grow and gets more and more attention. Uh, she had also mentioned a few other uh, individuals, um, Joanne Peterson. Joanne uh, Peterson from Learn, Learn to, to Cope. Cope and uh, phenomenal love uh, support group for the families and loved ones of the attic to really get together in a, a, a setting and actually learn to cope has, I think, like 13 chapters now in the Commonwealth, you know. Um, and basically, you know, it's a phenomenal opportunity for the parent or loved one who may be struggling because of a loved one who is an addict to come in. And, I mean, literally, we're talking 50, 100 parents getting together on an evening to be supportive as well as sharing their concerns and issues. Yeah, you know? and, and to when we were first trying to understand why the media did not know more about this, you'd never heard about it on the news. You know, if there was any kind of a tragedy with um, an, an unfortunate car accident or uh, an event like that, it would be all over the news. But right. the drug overdoses weren't getting to that the, news. They were getting to the local news in many different areas, but yeah. it was not getting to the top yeah, news yeah. where everyone well, would know about it. You know, the, the, the opioid addiction issue here in southern Massachusetts, southeastern Massachusetts, is, is it's an epidemic. It's the largest epidemic anywhere in the country, quite honestly speaking. You know, if you went back about three years ago, on average, two people a day were dying from an opioid overdose, you know, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts alone. And here in, in the city of Brockton, um, our local newspaper, The Enterprise, today, you know, they actually began running a, a series called Wasted Youth. And that particular series began to showcase the how big of an epidemic this really was. And, and there were a lot of, you know, tragedies um, from uh, children that were, were dying from the overdoses. But it can, even today, it continues to have updates as to what's going on. So your, your, your message of, you know, not getting it out there is valid because even though the enterprise did a phenomenal job locally around here, it doesn't really reach further out, you know. Uh, but it was an award-winning um, program. Well, yeah. if you remember, not long ago, when the drug Molly came into yeah. play, and there was a few students that uh, passed away from a nightclub and another one on a concert, look at what the media did with that story. Right. It was broadcast. It was, it was all out. Everyone saw it. Right. Every parent in Massachusetts went home and said to their kids, have you ever heard about this? Because that was brought to the forefront. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what needs to happen. And why that got the attention 
and then died right back out again. But that's exactly what I would like to see happen, where there's more attention towards you know, what happens. We don't need to put names. It doesn't have to mm-hmm. embarrass families if they're concerned with, with um, the identity being mentioned. But why not talk about the numbers? If people knew just how big the numbers were, how many thousands of people have died in this state, how many tens of thousands throughout the country a year are passing away from, from drug overdose, I, I think it would shed some additional light. Uh, um, when I was talking um, to someone this afternoon, they were mentioning how the media does a great job at it warning us and informing us. They mentioned the E. coli, you know, mosquito yeah. mm-hmm. coming in. All the stations are warning everybody about E. Yeah. coli. Nobody has died. They're just giving a warning about an, and, an insect that could cause a problem. And during that week where they're sending these warnings out, uh, uh, several people will have passed away. Hundreds will have overdosed and, and yeah. been mm-hmm. saved and not a peep about those individuals. And ultimately, that's what I would like to see more attention on, just how I mean, many people are affected. I, I, I think in touching on that theme, I think you know what society has chosen to do is to look at the addiction issue as, I think you mentioned it earlier with your daughter, she made the decision to do it, or the addict makes a decision to take the drug, you know, from, from that perspective. So from a society perspective, they're looking at it as that, well, that was their choice. They chose to do it. They're not looking at it as it's a medical illness. Right, the you stigma. Know, you know, the stigma associated with it. So um, how we have to do that is, you know, this is why we're here today, quite honestly, right. is to get that message out there. And, you know, even if we affect one person, one loved one, you know, one parent out there that has listened to the story today, then we've succeeded in taking it a step further going forward. Oh, it's certainly you know. a cultural change yeah. that needs to be brought on. Right. Years ago, I think of, I look back at, uh, in the early okay. 80s with, with the AIDS yep. uh, epidemic. Go. Okay. And, uh, and it wasn't until the AIDS quilt began to develop and people put names Awareness, and faces right. and loved ones to the problem that they realized right. this is a and, major and, issue. And, and, and we're moving that with our vigils, but we're out of time, believe it or not. I told you this was going to go by it real fast. Go by quick. Tom, I want to thank you for uh, joining us here thank on you. The Deadly Silence. And on behalf of all of us, have a good evening. Thank you.